This thing came out pretty nice. This is the helmet of Richard Ryder, better known as Nova. And this quickly turned into one of my absolute favorite helmets that I've ever made. And I wanna show you guys how I made it, how I printed it, how I oriented it, and how I got the electronics to work by just when I put it on my head, it turns on and off. It's pretty cool, so let's take a look. So I was browsing CG Trader one day, trying to find new helmets to print and new projects to start. And I stumbled upon this thing. Now at the time, I wasn't really overtly familiar with Nova. Uh, I just knew he was a Marvel character and hadn't been introduced into the MCU yet. But it just seemed like one of those helmets that just would look absolutely amazing on display. So I decided to print it. Let me start off by saying that this is actually a very easy project. Mjolnir up there used to be one of my favorite, you know, recommendations for starter prints. And, you know, if you want to start making props and all that fun stuff, what's a good little project to break into? And Mjolnir was at the top of that list. It's fun, it's easy, and it fits on an Ender 3. But if you don't have something like an Ender 3, maybe you have a little bit of a bigger printer. This thing, this thing is disgustingly easy. And it's pretty fun and pretty cool to look at. This thing fits on a CR-10S. Uh, I don't really think it would fit on an Ender. You'd have to get really creative with positioning and or scale it down a little bit, but it's only two pieces, the helmet and the star. So this is the file here on CG Trader. Just search Nova, you'll see it. It is by Moleventum, whatever, however you say that. Anyway, it's a pretty simple file. Buy it, download it. It's gonna give you a couple different parts, nothing too crazy. They give you, I had already went in and cut the star into two pieces and I'll show you that in a minute, but there's a 2.0. I wasn't really able to tell the difference between what the repaired files were and what they weren't. And as you can see here, it does fit on an ender, but I have to warn you printing at this size. If you print it at the base stock 100% scale, this is what you're gonna end up with. Now, this isn't the modeler's fault. He designed a helmet. I'm the one who didn't check scaling the first time. I'm so used to printing helmets from DO3D and Akira Yuming and some um, frequent modelers that I use that I know they all fit my head. This was a new modeler. I should have checked the size and uh, now I have a helmet that's a little bit too small, but fret not. I was able to use this helmet for a little bit of paint testing and I gave it some cool features, but we'll talk about this later. This helmet right here is 110% scale and it fits me like a glove. Better yet, there's one more. This is 115% and as you can see, it's just a little bit bigger, but this is for someone else who has a bigger head than me. So if we scale this up even to 110%, it's gonna be very hard pressed to get this to fit on an ender. Now you could probably cut these little um, the little tabs off here or position this however you want, but eh, I don't know if I'd print this on an ender. Even if you move up to a CR-10S, you can quickly see that this thing now fits beautifully inside the build volume and you don't even need to position it in any weird angles. It'll fit standing straight up perfectly. Now obviously you're gonna use supports around the rim, and then in the eyes, but this is another helmet, just like the Mandalorian helmets, where you don't need any of this inner support. So the first thing I would do is go, drop a support blocker there, scale it up a lot, and call it a day. That's it. Position this however you want, adjust your settings, do whatever you need to. But I'll tell you what, on my Ender 5 Plus, I printed this thing so quick because it is such a low detailed helmet. There aren't a bunch of details and lines on it. So I just did this the lowest quality possible and sanded it all down. I'm gonna make this a 0.38. You know what, let's make it a 0.4. And we're gonna do a 7% infill because that's what this helmet is. We're gonna do this at 120 millimeters a second because that's what I did. Now this is my under five plus, not my CR-10S. We're gonna do normal supports at 72 everywhere, support density one, a raft and go. You don't need some crazy settings on this piece. There isn't, there's nothing to it. It's easy. 19 hours for an entire helmet. That's insane. Now I'd probably review this. I might look at these parts right here because as this part starts to print, that's probably not gonna survive and that's gonna tip over. So I'd probably go in here and drop in some custom supports. If you don't have custom supports enabled, you can get them up here in the marketplace. Just search them and you can take any supports you want and drop them along to reinforce whatever part you decide that you want to print. You could also lower your support overhang angle. Mine's at 70, but that's to keep the eyes and everything else from getting too squirrely, so I'm not too worried about that. You could also tilt the helmet back. You can do really whatever you want with it, but you do not need this inner support, I promise you. It goes up to 20 hours, and you can see here, now these first little parts of the helmet are nice and supported, and I trust that. It would start to print. The eyes are gonna get some good, um, good coverage in there and I'm not worried about that. 
Laying it down takes the same amount of time. And it seems to use a little bit less support material and it supports the entire thing. So honestly, I'd probably try to go this way, this route about it. I can't specifically remember exactly which way I printed it. This looks a lot more familiar. And again, 20 hours, half a roll, and you have a helmet. Laying it down like this even fits on a CR-10S, and the CR-10S bed size is the same as the V2, the Pro V2, the Artillery Sidewinder X1. Um, this would fit on a multitude of printers, and to get just a little bit more size out of it, you could always rotate it just a little bit, and that gives you even more volume to play with. So go ahead, orient it, print it however you want. Again, you don't need to worry about the quality of this if you're gonna be sanding it and using any filler primer or spray putty. This is an easy print. Now, printing the star can be a little bit of a nightmare. I decided to cut it and it made it worlds easier. So drop it in a mesh mixer, select plain cut, and then you're gonna to wanna to rotate this 90 degrees, and then you're gonna slowly lower it down until it's cutting directly through this middle part of the star because this is gonna help you hide where it is, where the seam line is. So right about there, and then you're gonna keep both and accept. And then go to separate shells, and now you're gonna have two parts, one and two, boom. That's cut, and then that's cut. So you can select one, export it, save it, come back, export it, two, save it. And that will leave you with two cool little stars for you to position and print. Now these would fit on an Ender 3. If you happen to have one and you just wanna burn it, absolutely go for it. And what this lets you do is stand the star up like that, like that, and then center, let's see, we'll arrange all of them, something like that, and then you can position them. What I did is I positioned them all just so they weren't touching, but they were inside of each other like that. Print them standing up perfectly. Doesn't need any supports and you can just fuse them together. I would do a little bit of a nicer quality on these only because the tips, and I would go a little bit slower because as you start to build higher, you can start to lose a little bit of that detail. So maybe not dynamic, eh, super, we'll do a super. Um, I want them to be kind of strong because I don't want these to ever shatter or break. 60 is not bad, uh, supports, it doesn't really matter, and a raft doesn't matter. Six hours, 32 grams, pretty easy. And there you go, they'll print just like that pop them off, fuse them together. You can plastic weld them. You can use uh, uh, some CA glue to fuse these together. These aren't really gonna be subjected to crazy forces. And then you just wood fill the lines. You couldn't even tell, I bet, that mine were filled like that. And it's a good practice for A, learning how to plane cut, how to fuse prints together. And it's very forgiving because it's hidden in a nice seam line. So get to it, print these out and uh, get to assembly. So now let me show you how I got here from all the way over here. Now, this isn't how I printed the helmet originally. I had some gold filament and I was testing it out for another video and I decided to print it. I thought it'd be pretty uh, neat to print it in a gold filament with a red star. And you know, for like a Halloween costume or a kid's helmet, this already looks pretty good. You can see the layer lines on this. This again was printed. This one was another 110% helmet like that. I think this one printed in 16 hours. I really pushed the limit on this one. And as you can see, I didn't have any center supports in there. So it left it a little stringy on the outside, but as you can see the, the top or the inside, but as you can see, the top is totally fine. I print my Mandalorian helmets like this, and I printed probably close to 15 Mando helmets exactly like that by blocking out the inner supports. If you want more settings and information on printing helmets with no center support, go check out my how to 3D print a Mandalorian video. There's a lot more information in there, especially more detailed helmets that aren't just baby smooth like this. And I bet you can't even tell that right in here, these two parts are just glued together. I didn't do any PLA welding yet or anything. They're just fused and you can't even tell I cut them up. So how do we get from that to that? This was this helmet right here was lightly sanded and not with my normal palm sander, though you could use it. That one I used my palm sander on and that took me about five minutes to smooth down and then I hit it with some generic primer. This helmet, however, I hit it with spray putty and this is filler primer on drugs. It is. It is a much thicker spray. It is more of a Bondo polyurethane base. It's not like normal spray paint. And I would not recommend it for highly detailed pieces. Like I would have never used this on certain parts of my Iron Man suit. It goes on very thick, but then it sands nice and smooth. Once I was done with the spray putty, I hit it with just some red Motip primer. And this Motip stuff, I'm starting to really love. You can only get the spray putty in the UK from what I can see. Um, you're gonna be hard pressed to find it in the States, but just sand this thing down. This is with one pass of each, a light scuff, the spray putty, another light scuff, and then this uh, primer. And this thing's ready for the uh, the gloss black that I'm gonna use, followed by the um, metallic gold. So 
Looks pretty good. I like it. I'm happy with it. Now, golds are a nightmare. They are. They have been the bane of my existence. I have some golds there. I have some golds on my Iron Man suit. I have some golds up there on Stormbreaker. All of my Infinity Stone props, Buster Sword. I've gone through a lot of golds. And now I can finally find, have a gold that I can clear coat. And it's not the gold I was expecting. In the process of trying to repaint my Iron Man suit and find a nice gold that's more true to the Metallic Hot Toys figure over there, I stumbled upon these Montana Black and Montana Gold spray paints. And it gives you a little bit of a preview at the top of what they look like. Now, you could reach this finish with a lot of work. That's as close as I got. I'm pretty happy with it. Problem is, once you hit this with a clear coat, sometimes you can change the color. Now, this is a 2K two-part clear coat. It kind of looks like that. And it has an activator at the bottom because once you mix and catalyze this, it's only good for 24 to 48 hours. If you want more information on that type of clear coat, go look, go check out my um, finding the perfect Iron Man color video. I go through all of these golds, some reds, and it's just testing and showing you guys how to evaluate spray paints. But I knew Nova was going to be shiny and I wanted it to look nice. So I tested these two golds out, but in that same video, I tested out this Rust-Oleum Metallic Gold. Now I've been using this for years on my Gundam models and I started using it on my Iron Man stuff. This Battle Damage Mark 85 helmet is exactly that Rust-Oleum Gold, but there's no clear coat on that. So it does flake kind of easily. I wanted to test a clear coat on it, this Ultra 2K, and it took it perfectly. I am still blown away how nice this looks with the, the clear coat on it. It, it didn't, um, brown, it didn't yellow, it didn't transform into some weird color. Now, if you've ever tried to clear coat a gold with a cheap clear coat, you know exactly what I'm talking about. It turns brown and it loses all of that shine. This is what that turned into. Now, this looks metallic. This just looks like a glossy gold that I don't really like. And they're the same colors. I couldn't really tell a difference between these two because originally I had that Nova helmet as one and this Nova helmet as another, maybe S chrome, gold chrome, black. Okay. I just discovered it. This is this one. This is this one. But when they're painted, you really couldn't tell a difference between them. But you may not have access to all of these colors. You might be somewhere where you can't get Rust-Oleum or you can't get Montana Gold. So you're gonna need to get some gold paint and do some testing. That's what was cool about having this misprinted helmet. I was able to take it and test some paints out and kind of experiment and find a gold that I liked. And now, I have one. As for the star, this is a new paint I discovered. It's a more Motip paint, but it's a metallic Motip paint. And it's actually pretty nice. Um, originally I had done both stars and then they, the paint failed. I didn't let the, um, the base coat dry long enough. Now in your research, when you're doing metallic golds and metallic reds, you're gonna learn that base coats are important. A, a high gloss black base coat, a high gloss red base coat, all these things affect how the gold sheen comes out. You can't just go right over primer and expect results like this. Again, testing is required. But this Mo Motip metallic red did come out very nice. And again, I just fused that little seam and you can kind of see it on the back. I didn't really care about the back, so whatever. But I'm happy with how it came out. Now, let's talk about electronics because these helmets operate ever so differently. I had fun with the first one and now when I want to turn it on, there's a little battery pack sitting on the inside right here. Turn it on, it runs all the way to the cosplay LED eyes, but notice the eyes still are not on until I take the star, which has a magnet sitting here, and when I put the star on, the eyes turn on. Sometimes it's a little hard to get the positioning, but there we go. The eyes are on, that's it. How am I doing that? Well, first let's talk about these cosplay LED eyes. Now, if you're doing something like a Nova helmet, he has big eyes. These are the solid plastic ones that I used to use and they're cool and all, but they're not quite big enough for Nova's eyes. They would barely, barely cover up the helmet that's too small in no way, shape or form are they big enough to cover up the scaled up helmet. So you need to make sure you're getting the flexible ones. The flexible cosplay LED eyes are actually bigger. Not by much, it's more of a length thing, but it does help, especially when you're doing this type of helmet. So make sure you get the bendable ones, the flexible ones. And I have a video on that. I'll link that down below. So make sure you guys go check that out. These things are an absolute game changer. And with this entire little purchase, it gives you basically everything you need for this. It gives you a little battery pack, a little switch, plenty of wire length, and your little eyes. For this circuit right here though, hiding inside here is a very, very tiny little reed switch. These things are awesome. And I've shown you guys these before in plenty of videos and electronics tutorials, 
but basically it won't turn on unless a magnet gets close to it. You can see right now that the eyes are off. I have it switched on. And if I take a magnet and move it close to the reed switch, the eyes turn on and I'm not touching that wire at all. See, pretty neat. Science, I have that reed switch sitting behind this magnetic purse clasp. Now these things I use in a bunch of my helmets too. They're little self-aligning magnetic purse clasps. And only one side of this is magnetic. The thicker side is the magnetic side. That'll stick to things just fine. This side, however, is not magnetic. So this is what I have inside the helmet sitting right in front of the reed switch, kind of like that. So imagine it's sitting in front of the reed switch and then the other side comes in, clip clasps on, and then the eyes turn on. Now you do have to play with positioning just a little with reed switches, but once you figure it out, it works every time. And when I put the star on, the eyes turn on. Now the system I did in this helmet is pretty much 99% the exact same way. However, now I have a limiter switch sitting on the top. So when it touches my head, the eyes turn on. I use these little limiter switches in my Iron Man helmets, in my suit and a bunch of other little props. And basically you have electricity coming into one, it'll have a C on it and that's your common. So electricity is gonna be coming in through that side and it'll be coming out either this part until you hit the trigger and then it flips over and comes out the other side. So let's get rid of the read switch. You wanna read NC and NO, normally open and normally close. When you aren't touching the switch, that is the position of each of those pins. So we want normally open. Because if I touch normally closed, the eyes are gonna light up. A little hard to see, but you can see it. So I'm touching that last pin and the eyes are lighting up until I press the trigger. So it's normally a, it's a normally a closed circuit, a closed loop until I hit that circuit and it turns off. Now with this little toggle switch here, when I might put the helmet on and my head hits this little trigger, the eyes light up. That's it. This is the entire circuit inside this helmet. And all I did was I mounted it to the battery pack itself I just shortened the wires and you can see that it's kind of glued over to the battery pack. And then there's some Velcro holding it up into the top. And then when I put the helmet on, the eyes turn on. Real quick, thank you Mysterio 3D for giving me the idea for the reed switch with the star. He was working with a little bit of a different system with contacts and all of that. And then I decided to add the reed switch. So the idea was inspired by him, by you. So thank you very much, man. It's a, it's a really cool idea. And I'm not done utilizing um, things like that. This is a really great little project to get your feet wet on printing a helmet, on sanding something, on slicing something, very simple electronic circuits. You can just get these LED eyes, call it a day, have an on and off switch, or you can get creative with the magnets, with the reed switches, with the trigger switches, and just have a little bit of fun with it. I just did an entire outro and didn't hit record. So we're here again, but that pretty much does it for this video, guys. Again, it's a pretty cool, simple little project. Uh, I definitely recommend it if you have something that can fit the printer. If you only have an Ender 3, you can cut it up. Um, in that how to print Mandalorian helmet video thing, I definitely teach you guys how to use mesh mixer to slice up prints a lot better. And it'd be much easier on this one to hide the seams because you could just smooth it all down pretty simply. One thing I do want to touch on real quick though is the fact that people seem to not, people seem to want me the metallic look on some of these projects and helmets, but they don't want the things to operate and act like metal. If you have a perfectly smooth metal surface, you're gonna get fingerprints, you're gonna get smudges, it's gonna get a couple little dings and scratches. Personally, I think that just it lends so much more to the realism of it. You, It's kinda hard to have both of them. While this faceplate looks good, just something about that gloss takes away from the metallic sheen. It doesn't look metallic, it looks like glossy gold. Maybe it's just me. This paradox seems to absolutely plague the Mandalorian scene. Everybody wants that nice shiny metal Bezcar look, but they don't want it to operate like nice shiny metal. You're gonna get smudges and fingerprints on it. Have you ever touched pure raw titanium or you know some stainless steel? It, it, gets, it gets dirty. And I don't know about you guys, I think it makes the helmet look so much cooler that it takes these stains and these little imperfections, but that's just me. So no, this helmet in particular doesn't have a clear coat on it, but I'm okay with it and the paint seems to be holding up just fine. It's gonna be on display most of the time anyway. I like it. If you guys haven't already, if you could subscribe, that'd be really cool and it would really help the channel out. I have so many more helmets planned, some that you guys haven't seen already, and I'm going to be releasing them over the next few weeks or months, especially as we get settled into the new house back in America, and I'm really excited for that. If you guys want more in the meantime, please go check out the Discord. There's a link for that down below. Uh, it, it's for 3D printing, cosplay, everything in between. There's electronics, there's professionals, there's noobs. Just come hang out. It's free. Why not? As always, guys, thank you so much for watching. 
and you have a good day. Can I just say how perfect it would be of a time to introduce Nova into the MCU with Thanos having freshly destroyed Xandar and the Nova Corps? Maybe some Nova soldier makes his way to Earth, crash lands into New York, finds a little kid, finds a teenage boy, finds somebody named Richard Ryder, maybe he gives him his powers and then he's kind of been lurking in New York this whole time, not sure when to you know present himself and it's a couple years later and then we have Nova, MCU. Marvel, come on, it's like perfect, do it.